Hi there. Welcome to the chapter on lecture or the lecture on chapter 9, the second chapter of orthopedics, all right? So remember chapter 8, we also were talking about orthopedics, the study or practice or knowledge of what makes a child straight, okay, which is our musculoskeletal system, the muscles and the bones. Chapter 8 we talked about bones. Now chapter 9, we're going to be talking about the muscles. Before I launch into the lecture, of course, I like to start with my term of the day. This is a particularly good one. I like, I, this is one of my favorite terms of the day that I have. The term is fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP for short, all right? It literally translates to, let's break it down, okay? Ia, meaning condition of abnormal uh, development or growth of fibers, fibrous tissue. All right, ossificans, osseo meaning bone, and progressiva meaning progressive, it progresses over time. Essentially, this is a disease where um, fibrous tissue over time progressively becomes bone tissue. Okay, it's not very well understood, it's a very, very rare disease, and there's one sort of, I guess, famous patient named Harry Eastlack, who had this disease, where his connective tissue started to turn to bone from a young age. He died at the age of 40 from pneumonia, actually, but he, at the time that he died, he couldn't move anything, not even his lips. He'd lost movement of his lips. He had essentially turned to stone, as a lot of um, older medical textbooks or medical references to, to, to this condition that's what they, how they described it. So you can see his skeleton here, which he donated to science and is on display at the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. Again, I think it was like the fifth time I've mentioned it in the class. And uh, if you ever go to Philly, I still recommend that you check it out. It's pretty cool. Um, and you can sort of see it in this picture. You can definitely see it better live. But his skeleton has all these extra growths, these extra formations. I think it's really clear here in his arm here where it should just be a humerus bone right here. It looks like almost like his deltoid muscle has ossified, turned to bone. And also there's a whole bunch of stuff, you know, excess bone growth right here at the bottom of the humerus. So just illustrates you if you can zoom if you zoom into the spine, you can also see a lot of extra bone growth there as, and around the shoulders and even in his lower body as well. So essentially his connective tissues start turning to bone and he loses the ability to move, loses the ability to move to undergo motion. Now it's not really well understood why this happens. I think they that m scientists think that has something to do with when a muscle gets injured that, that then that the connective tissue, instead of healing properly when it heals, it heals as bone. Instead of forming some kind of scar tissue, the scar tissue is bone. So it's um, a very weird disease, very rare, only about 400 known cases to be recorded ever. And this one patient, Harry Eastlack, lived to the age of 40. This is a picture when he was younger, um, already sort of showing the distorted... Uh, posture that he had from his bones or his connective tissues actually hardening. That's enough time on that. Um, so the basic anatomy of the muscular system, there are three types of muscles. Skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Skeletal muscle is the voluntary muscle. This is a muscle that controls our body movement and that we actually have voluntary conscious control over. Uh, cardiac muscle is the heart muscle. It's one big muscle that pumps. And then there's smooth muscle, which is the muscle that we do. Both cardiac muscle and smooth muscle are involuntary muscles. We don't consciously control the movement of those muscles. Smooth muscles align our organs and blood vessels and the bronchi, um, other things like that. They help to do digestion to move food along via peristalsis, they help blood flow, um, particularly in, well, everywhere. Um, they're involved in the contraction of the bronchi, particularly 
what's popping into mind is pathological constriction like in asthma and those are smooth muscles so I just basically uh, gave you the lecture from these couple of slides but you can look over them you have them in your notes the other differences between these muscles are the actual the physiology or the way they look under uh, microscope the histology so skeletal muscle is striated it has these banding patterns and cardiac muscle and smooth muscle, well cardiac muscle has these very faint striations. It also has these other dark spots, these dark lines or bands, and I, I forget what they're called, but you don't need to know it for this class, but you will in a &P. Um, So smooth muscle is completely non-striated, so there's differences histologically as well. In this class we are mostly focusing on skeletal muscles, the muscles that we move involuntarily and naming them and naming the types of movements and the types of injuries or diseases that affect skeletal muscles. Though um, you should know that there are three different types of muscles. Know what the cardiac muscle pertains to the heart, which you should from the word itself, and smooth muscle lines blood vessels, the intestines, etc., other organs, and that we do not have voluntary control over these two. Right? Um, again, this is a note slide, but I'm not going to stay on it. I'm going to use this one as a visual. For the basic anatomy of a muscle and some of the terminology associated with muscles, so muscles attach to bones via tendons, these thick, fibrous, white bands here on either end of the bone. The origin is where the tendons insert into a stationary bone, so in this case into the scapula, bone that doesn't move a lot. The insertion is where the muscle is inserted into or attached to a bone that does have more movement, more mobility, and helps the muscle to move. The meaty, fat, juicy part of the muscle in the middle that is called the belly of the muscle. All right. So some other things about muscles, they're wrapped in a membrane called the fascia. Muscle fascia is this membrane that just kind of wraps around muscle groups and holds them together and keeps them protected. Um, bursi, which would be the plural of bursa, a bursa is like um, at, the, at a joint, you know, if you have you have synovial membranes that are filled with fluid. Bursas are at the joints of muscles and bones uh, in the major joints like your elbow and your knees and your shoulder. And they can become inflamed. You can get bursitis, which we'll talk about when we talk about diseases and conditions of the muscular system. Um, and an aponeurosis, these are all sort of uh, vocabulary words and key parts to the muscle system here. An aponeurosis is a flat band of tissue. It's kind of like a flat tendon. Um, when you have large flat muscles that need to be attached to bone or to another muscle group, you have an aponeurosis. So it's, it's kind of similar to a tendon in its functionality. It's to connect the muscle to something else. And it's in places only, there's only a few of them. Um, the two that I can think of off the top of my head are the aponeurosis in your abdo abdomen, and there's also one in your head, in the cranium, that we'll go over later. The retinaculum is like a bracelet of tissue. It's a band of tissue that goes around your wrists and also your ankles, and its purpose is to hold in all these flexor and extensor muscles. You have all these muscles connected to each of your fingers on either side, all right, that help to flex and extend the fingers in your hand and also your toes. And so to keep all of those wire, all that wiring straight, you have this band of tissue, the retinaculum, that helps to keep them in place. So now for all the major muscles of the body. There's I think maybe 20 that we're going over, not a big deal. I'm sure you have to know a lot more for anatomy, physiology, and possibly human biology. But in a way, the muscle names are kind of easy to remember because they all really descri are descriptive of the muscle. 
uh, they either t they either are named for the muscle's size, location, or shape, or function. And so it's definitely, if you have a strong bearing in medical terminology, you should be able to see the name of a muscle and figure out where it is or what it does in a lot of cases. Um, so for instance, biceps brachii, where is that? It's in the arm. We know because brachio is a combining form for arm. So biceps brachii is in the arm. Where in the arm? It happens to be in the upper arm, on the anterior side. All right, this is mine. It's not very big, but that's, you know, that's what I got. Okay, it's called biceps because it has two heads. Let's go back to that picture here. Um, here we go. Biceps, two heads. It splits at the top, so it has two heads, biceps. Seps like cephalo. Um, brachioradialis is in the arm. Radio be for the radial for the radius. All right, and brachio for arm. Extensor digitorum extends your digits, your fingers. Um, the flexor hallucis brevis. Flexor it flexes your hallux, your big toe. And it's a short muscle, brevis meaning short. So it's a short muscle that flexes the big toe. It's all in the name, all in the name. It's my favorite muscle, by the way. I think it's fun to say. Flexor hallucis brevis. Gluteus maximus is in the buttocks, and it's a large muscle. It's the large muscle in the buttocks, the gluteus maximus. Rectus abdominis is in the abdomen, and rectus means straight, it's a straight muscle. It also is a muscle that helps to keep you straight. We talk about your core muscles and your posture. Um, it is a straight muscle in the abdomen. It's, sorry, it's your eight pack, you know, or your six pack, or whatever pack you have or don't have. Temporalis is a muscle in the face, in the head, along the temple. All right. Uh, the triceps brachii, also in the arm. This one is in the posterior side of the arm. And it is a muscle that has three heads, triceps. It works antagonistically to the biceps brachii. What do I mean by that? I mean that all the muscles in the body have an opposite muscle in the body. So for a mu every part of your body that can flex, there's also a muscle that helps to extend. There's a flexor muscle and an extensor muscle. So the body's muscles work in antagonism with each other. They work opposite each other, but in that way, they're also working together to give you movement. So there are several types of opposite movements that are controlled by each muscle pair. Um, and I'll go through them on these next couple slides through some tables from your book. The first ones are flexion and extension, and they are run by flexor and extensor muscles, all right? Flexion is any bending, anytime you bend at a joint. So my fingers, I'm flexing my fingers right now. Extending is straightening at a joint. So my fingers are extended, flexed, extended, flexed, all right? The next pair of movements we have is abduction and adduction. I wish they were on the same slide. Abduction and adduction, all right? Abduction is to move a body part away from the midline. So usually when we're talking about these two movements, we're talking about our limbs, either our arms or our legs, being abducted. Okay, Abducted meaning to move away from the midline, kind of like if a child gets abducted, they're being taken away from their home or their parents. Okay, So abduction is moving away from the midline, and adduction is moving towards the midline. Okay, well, I'm going to pull up my camera so I can, oh, I don't know, let's see. Do, 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 A little break in the video here. I also don't know how to edit this part of the video out, so you're just going to have to bear with me for a second. I, you can see my face right now. I cannot. I do not have anything showing me what view you have. So I'm just going to open a program real quickly so I can 
step back so I can demonstrate some of these movements a little bit better. Okay, so let's re-angle here. All right, so you can see my arms and upper body well enough. Okay, so, so again, adduction, or sorry, abduction versus adduction, okay, of your arms. Rotation, we're talking about, mostly we're talking about your head, rotating your body around some kind of axis like your neck. Um, so like when you're shaking your head, no, you're rotating your head. Supination and pronation, these are opposite movements. We can talk about the whole body being supinate or prone, or we can talk about parts of the body, namely the hands and feet, being prone or supine. So supine is when you are lying on your back, staring up at the sky. Same thing with your hands. If you're, This is the face of your hand and the back of your hand. So if you are lying on your back with the palm, facing upward, that is also a supine position of the hands. Pronation is the opposite, lying face down or your hands being face down, okay? Um, eversion and inversion, turning a body part outwards or towards the side. Mainly we're talking about feet usually when we're talking about eversion or inversion, okay? So if these my hands are my feet. All right, eversion, inversion, turning outwards, turning inwards. I think this is pigeon toed. Is that when you have your feet pointing inwards? Is that what people say? So this is just a slide that is um, illustrating some of these different movements. Okay, so um, someone who is shaking their head no is doing rotation of the head. This character here is doing a jumping split. Both his arms and his legs are abducted. They're also both extended because they're straight. His hands are prone. They're facing down. And his feet are dorsiflex. That's the last one I didn't go over. If your feet are, are if you pull your toes up towards the sky, you are dorsiflex, dorsiflexing. I think I made up that verb. If you plant, if you point your feet like a ballet dancer, point your toes, that is plantar flexion, okay? So this girl here is, is demonstrating plantar flexion. This, I like this pose, kind of goes through a lot of different movements. So her arms are adducted towards the midline, but her legs are abducted away from. Her arms are extended, possibly overextended, her elbows kind of seem to bend the other way, um, her, but her legs are flexed, they are bent at the knee, um, and her hands are prone, and her feet are plantar flexed. So I have this slide here, which is one I encourage you to sort of practice with your, on, you know, at home, uh, sort of describing the different positions based using these muscular movements, whether they're their limbs are flexed or extended or abducted or adducted, inverted, everted, etc. I also usually in the classroom have um, a little interact, a little activity at this time. I usually have everyone stand up and I sort of do like a Simon Says and walk you through. Usually I walk people through the movements of the Macarena. Um, and I thought about doing that on this video, but I'd feel really stupid doing it. So another way for you to practice, if you know the Macarena, get up and do it and practice how, what you would call each of those movements um, in terms of these flexion, adduction, etc. how you would direct someone to do that. Okay, so moving on to the names of the muscles and sort of the labeling pictures here. So these are the muscle, all the muscles in these pictures are the muscles that you're going to need to know for the test and for this class. All right, so here's another aponeurosis I was talking about, sort of like a big flat tendon that connects muscles of the face to the muscles in the back of the head, okay, or to the cranium, I guess. Um, the frontalis, 
where the frontal bone of the cranium is, where the frontal lobe of the cerebrum is, okay, frontalis muscle on top of that. The temporalis is on the side of the head where the temple, your temple is. The orbicularis orate, orbiculo, orbit, it orbits, circles, the oculi, the eyes, oculo. And the orbicularis oris circles, oral, the mouth. The buccinator is a muscle in your cheek that helps you with chewing, as is the masseter muscle, helps with mastication, I guess is a, could be a mnemonic there. Um, the sternocleidomastoid is this muscle here, also can be pronounced sternocleidomastoid, either one. And it connects from the sternum to the mastoid process. The mastoid process is a little like a bony projection off the back of the skull, back of the cranium. Right, so right here is where the mastoid process is. And this muscle extends all the way down to the sternum of the chest, you know, in the chest, and it helps to actually move your head, support your neck, etc. And then you have the platysma, which is a big flat muscle in the front of your neck. Muscles of the shoulders and chest, you have here, we're showing you the extension of the sternocleidomastoid, it's connected to the mastoid up here, connects down here to the sternum and the clavicle. Uh, the, oh, it does connect to the clavicle as well. Clido is a combining form for a clavicle. I should mention that. Um, in the front here, you have the pectoralis major. Pecto is a combining form for chest. So the major muscle in the chest is the pectoralis major. Um, you have the deltoid, which is a triangular-shaped muscle of the shoulder. Delta is a Greek letter that is a triangle-shaped. If you ever flowed... Delta Airlines, their symbol is a triangle. It's a, de it's a, Greek, a Greek letter, Delta. I guess it had meant triangle in, in Latin as well. So it's triangular shaped deltoid resembling a triangle. And it covers your shoulder like a shoulder pad. Um, there's also the intercostal muscles, the muscles in between all of the ribs that are involved in breathing. And you can see the front side of the trapezius muscle in your neck and shoulder and actually extends down your back, which you'll see on this slide. All right, so here's the back side, the trapezius in your neck and shoulder and then extending down your back. Um, and also the back side of the deltoid muscle. Remember, it caps the whole shoulder. And then this large, there's a large flat muscle in your back on either side called the latissimus dorsi, latissimus dorsi. Here's another aponeurosis, another long, flat, tendon-like sheath um, that connects the two. So the latissimus dorsi is often responsible for a lot of bending motions. So if you bend down and touch your toes and then stand back up, all right, the standing up, that's going to be the latissimus dorsi. And your triceps brachii is back here in the back of your arm. And here are the muscles of the arm. So like I was saying, the uh, posterior view of the arm. All right, so your triceps brachii. Just think of it more on the outside. This is showing you the outside of the arm. Um, you on, Also on the outside of your arm are your extensor muscles for your fingers. All right. If you extend the muscles in your hand and look down, you can see all the extensor muscles. I don't know if you can see them on my hand, kind of wiggling. All right? And they kind of go away when you flex. They pop out more when you extend because those are your extensor muscles. And you can feel them flexing if you are extending your fingers. All right, the flexor muscles of your fingers are on the anterior side of your wrist. So... When you flex, you can maybe see a little bit of wiggling here or feel it, all right? Um, so flexor muscles on the anterior side, extensor muscles on the posterior side. You also have the brachioradialis muscle here, which runs along the radius of radius bone of the arm. 
and connects up into the upper part of the arm. And of course the biceps brachii, most people know where their biceps are. And the last one I wanted to mention here is the thenar muscle. Thenar meaning thumb. It's that big, fat, meaty muscle in your thumb. And also notice the retinaculum, the bracelet-like band of tissue that holds all of these, all this wiring together. I like to think of it. Muscles of the abdomen that you should know. We already mentioned the rectus abdominis, that eight-pack here. The muscles that keep you straight, they are straight muscles in down the midline of the abdomen. And then you also have your oblique muscles, both the internal obliques and the external obliques seen here and also here, all right? And then, of course, there's this large aponeurosis that holds them together and sort of, uh, what's the word, steadies them. Muscles of the legs. So this will start with the anterior leg, the front side of the leg. Um, in the upper part of the leg, you have your quadriceps or your quads, people refer to them. And those are these four muscles here, the rectus femoris, which is this straight one, rectus straight, femur of the leg, femoris for femur. Um, it goes straight up and down along the femur is the rectus femoris. Then you have the vastus lateralis, the vastus medialis, and the vastus intermediate, intermedius. And these are three muscle groups that sort of are behind the rectus femoris. The lateral, vastus lateralis is on the lateral side, the outside. And the vastus medialis is on the inside, the middle, the, towards the midline. And the vastus intermedius is in between the two, sort of behind the rectus femoris. Okay, so you can't see it in this picture. Those four muscles make up the quads, the quadriceps, quad four, okay? The sartorius is not part of the quads, but it is part of the anterior upper leg, and it is the longest muscle in the body. That is a little bit of trivia for you there, and it kind of goes in diagonally here from the out lateral side of the hip to the medial side of the knee. The peroneus longus, where do you think that is? Peroneal me is an adjective for the fibula. The peroneus longus runs alongside the fibula, the lateral side of your leg. And the tibialis anterior runs along the tibia bone and is on the anterior side of the leg. And there's the retinaculum of the ankle, a band of tissue holding all these extensor and flexor muscles in. So the posterior leg will starting with the gluteus, the buttocks, you have the gluteus maximus and the gluteus medius underneath that. Then you have what are often referred to as the hamstrings, which is a, th a three muscles, a group of three muscles, uh, the biceps femoris, the semitendinous, and the semimembranous. Not necessary, not as easy to remember, I think, as the, as the quadriceps. Biceps femoris is a muscle that also runs along the bicep or the femur, but it has two heads. Um, the semitendinous and the semimembranous are um, just also muscles of the upper leg, part of the hamstrings. The calf muscle is called the gastrocnemius, gastrocnemius, and the tendon, the large tendon that tethers the gastrocnemius to the calcaneus, the heel bone is called the Achilles, t Achilles tendon, which is after a Greek, Greek mythology, a god in Greek mythology, or I think Achilles was the half-mortal son of a god and a human that mated, all right? And his, so his, his godmother dipped him. He was born mortal, but she dipped him into some river or something by holding his ankle and dipped him in this river to protect, give him this, like, protective godlike shield or something. And then he died in battle when he was hit in the heel um, by an arrow, his one unprotected heel. So if you think about it, if a man is hit in the Achilles tendon, it's really very paralyzing. He'd probably fall to the ground and then be very vulnerable to being killed by someone else in battle. So whether or not he was godlike at all, uh, the Achilles tendon is, is a vulnerable place. Um... I don't know if anyone out there has ever torn their Achilles tendon. I hear it's extremely painful. 
Um, okay, so that is all of the muscles, the major muscles of the body that you need to know. It's not too bad of a list, I hope, for you. Um, the basic physiology and anatomy of a muscle, just FY, you know, so you know I'm not really going to test you a whole lot on this. You'll definitely talk in a lot more detail about muscle physiology in human bio and in um, anatomy and physiology. We really don't touch on it at all on how muscles contract or the structure of the muscles in this class. Um, but muscle cells form these bundles called muscle fibers, all right? And the muscle fibers then all get bundled up into muscle fascicles. And then the muscle fascicles get bundled up into a muscle. And a muscle is then um, covered in this fascia, this you know, protective lining. And that is what a muscle is. It's a group of a bunch of muscle fascicles, which are a group of a bunch of muscle fibers, which are a bunch of muscle cells. So it's this big sort of, you know, packet, you know, like a Russian... What do they call those Russian dolls where it's like, you know, one doll inside of another? Okay, it's layers. They're layered. Muscles are layered. Um, so on to the second part of the chapter, which, of course, covers the different diseases and conditions that affect muscles. And I think I only have about ten slides here, so it should go pretty quickly. So you can have muscle atrophy if your muscles, if you don't use them for a long time, particularly in cases after surgery where you're on bed rest or if you um, if your arm or leg or something is in a cast and you don't get to use the muscles there for several weeks while your a bone is healing okay you can get muscle atrophy so muscle muscle degeneration a trophy without growth and development um, avulsion is a tearing away of a tendon or of a muscle from a bone so or tearing of a tendon so um, like if, for instance, in the case just a moment ago, I was talking about Achilles tendon. If your Achilles tendon rips and tears away from the calcaneus, which just gives me the heebie-jeebies just thinking about it, all right, that would be an avulsion. And I imagine they're very painful, and I've never had one, thank goodness. Fibromyalgia, uh, okay, let's break this word down. Algia, condition of pain. Myo, meaning muscle, and fibro, meaning fiber. So condition of pain in the muscle fibers. Um, I think this is not a very well understood condition why people get fibromyalgia. They tend to be along trigger points. Pain tends to be along trigger points, usually in the neck and back, um, and is treated with various drugs, analgesics and whatnot. Hypertension, hyperflexion, or sorry, hyperextension, hyperflexion injury is a fancy medical term for whiplash. Think about it hyperextension, extending the neck, and then flexing it. That's what happens in a car accident. You get extension and then flexion, but hyper, excessive extension and flexion. Um, and that is what whiplash is, and it can cause strain or avulsion of, of muscles in the neck, and then you can sue, I guess. Muscle contusion is a bruise of the muscle. So if you hit yourself along a muscle and you get Bruising is just hemorrhaging within, you know, just bleeding within the skin or within a tissue. So if you get hit really hard in a muscle and you get, you know, some blood vessels that break and you get bleeding within that muscle, it's painful, but it goes away, kind of self-heals. Muscle spasm is very quick, involuntary contractions of a muscle. It's usually temporary. Charlie horse or rye neck are the examples here. Charlie horse is usually in, of the calf muscle, the gastrocnemius, when that starts spasming. I remember as a kid in elementary school, I had a lot of friends who took like ballet lessons. I didn't myself, but I had some friends who did. And we, I remember sitting in like, sem, not seminars, like, um, you know, like if we were all in the gym because there was a speaker or the principal was speaking and so we were all sitting on the gym floor I guess a lot of people would sit with, you know, their, their knees up and their feet kind of pointed, and the girls would always get these Charlie, they'd always be like, ow, oh, Charlie horse, and start massaging their calf. I get them in my toes sometimes for some reason, like in bed when I'm sleeping, like if I'm pointing my feet or if I'm stretching my feet and I flex my toes, they start spasming. And the best way to, to fix the muscle spasm or to treat a muscle spasm is actually massage is a really good, or to flex it 
uh, manually. So like if your foot, if you're having a, a Charlie horse in your calf to flex your foot up to sort of um, stretch your calf muscle. Rye neck I've had once spasming in my neck muscle and I thought, I felt almost like it was 3 o'clock in the morning and if it wasn't so late at night, I think I might have actually gone to the ER. It was so painful. It was like paralyzing these spasms in my neck. And I ended up just convincing myself to go back to sleep and figure it out in the morning. And it was fine the next morning. I think I took some, I think I took some Advil or something, a painkiller, and it went away. But, oh, it was very uncomfortable. Uh, muscle strain. If you pull your muscle, that's a muscle strain. Um... Muscular dystrophy is a genetic disorder that you're born with, and it is causes de a degeneration of muscles that usually starts in the legs and works its way up. Uh, I don't actually know the like mechanism of that muscle degeneration and how it's different from something like... Um, so I guess we talked in Chapter 10 about different nerve degenerative diseases that cause loss of muscle control because you're actually the nerves are degenerating so you can't send motor commands to the muscles and then the muscles aren't working so then they atrophy this muscular dystrophy is actually degeneration of the muscle so it's not actually the nerves affecting the nerves um, myopathy is a general term for any you know disease of the muscle Myositis, any inflammation or infection of muscle. Myalgia, any pain of the muscle. So, you know, if you go to a spin class one day and you work out really hard for 45 minutes and the next day you're super sore, you've got muscle pain, you've got myalgia. That's the fancy way to say it, is that you have myalgia. If you have pain in a lot of different muscle groups, we would call that polymyalgia, pain in many muscles. Myasthenia gravis is, or myasthenia gravis, is literally translates to a condition of lack of strength in muscles. Myasthenia gravis. And it's usually in the face. I, I don't remember the cause of it. I don't know if it's a genetic thing or a side effect of some other disorders. But it usually affects the face and it results in a drooping, drooping of the eyelids and also sometimes of other facial muscles. And that drooping, the medical word for drooping, is ptosis. The P is silent. It's a Greek language thing. The P is silent. So it's pronounced ptosis. And you'll also see this as a suffix in a couple of chapters from now. Um, still means drooping. You can have a lot of the diseases of the muscles that we're talking about are injuries that you can acquire oftentimes from exercise or sports. A repetitive strain energy, energy, a re repetitive strain injury or an RSI is any type of muscle injury that you get from doing some kind of repetitive movement. So, um, like baseball pitchers or can get tendonitis in their you know elbows. Uh, same with tennis players, carpal tunnel syndrome from sitting and typing at a computer screen all day. I guess probably piano players could get it as well from repetitive movements of the wrist and hands. Um, different types of tumors that can affect the muscle, a rhabdomyoma, which is a benign tumor of the muscle, of skeletal muscle, so it's called a rod-shaped muscle tumor, kind of like the rod shapes of the striations in the muscle. A rhabdomyosarcoma is a cancerous uh, muscle tissue, a muscle tumor. Um, sarco, a sarcoma, sarcoma is being cancerous, whereas a myoma not necessarily. A rotator cuff tear, your rotator cuff is in your shoulder, it helps your shoulder rotate and it can be torn and it can be painful. Um, some different Diseases that affect muscular movement, not so much the muscle tissue itself. Ataxia is a condition without coordination. So if you have uncoordinated movements, I like my like example that I think of first is someone who's really drunk and who can't walk the straight line. All right, that's ataxia, a condition of no coordination. Now that's temporary, caused by drunkenness. But some people might have diseases that cause their coordination to be off as well. And actually, that's, 
it's that's probably not the best that might not be a true example of ataxia ataxia it might be that specifically the muscles aren't working properly whereas i think in drunkenness it's your it's coming from your brain it, your brain is not functioning properly it causes the ataxia bradykinesia is um, often associated with parkinson's where movements are stereotypically slow bradykinesia brady slow kinesia condition of movement right like kinetics movement dyskinesia would be abnormal movements, so like um, tics or abnormal sort of reflexes or repetitive movements that are often associated with different neurological disorders. So it's sort of neurologic and muscular. And hyperkinesis is excessive movement, all right? Restless leg syndrome is an example of hyperkinesis, someone who has... Um, their legs are kind of twitchy, essentially. It's ex excess twitching in the legs, particularly at night when they're trying to sleep. And also, another disease that's not really well understood, but affects a lot of people. Um, possible nutritional causes there. I've heard iron deficiency. Bursitis is an inf inflammation or infection of the bursa that I mentioned earlier in the lecture. It's also commonly referred to as housemaid's knee from the idea that I guess a lot of housemaids used to get bursitis of their knees because they were always um, kneeling on the floor to scrub floors. So spending a lot of time kneeling on the floor can cause bursitis of the knees. Also, um, a lot of runners, soccer players, people who, you know, if you're using a joint a lot, you can get um, inflammation or of the bursa and usually has to have fluid removed to relieve that. Deputrin's contracture, or any type of contracture, is any time where your muscle is like permanently flexed and stuck in that position. Um, in the case of deputrin's contracture, you get this contracture of the fascia. The muscle fascia starts to sort of compress, and the, and the muscle, one of the extensor muscles, specifically this of your ring finger in your hand starts to contract and you can't the flexor contracts and you can't release it so you get this finger that's kind of permanently bent and you can't extend it um, there's actually I think there each finger has a different name like this finger is Deputrin's contracture the index finger is some other guy's names contract you know like Collie's contracture or something um, like each each doctor got to name their own contracture I don't know why but I don't know why Deputrin's contracture is the one that's featured in the book fasciitis is any inflammation or infection of the muscle fascia um, plantar flat fasciitis a good example there are a lot of people have heard of plantar fasciitis or unfortunately experienced it again common in people who are avid runners. Um, it's a inflammation of the fascia in the foot, plantar fascia, and um, is very painful and usually is treated by just stretching the calf muscle. It's like, a I guess, a tightening of the muscles in the feet. And um, a lot of people who have it, either they have to do a lot of massage of their feet, like with a tennis ball, they just like rub their foot on a tennis ball, or they wear like a special brace at night that keeps their foot flexed and sort of helps stretch out the muscles in the feet and the calf muscle. Um, but that's an example of fasciitis where the fascia is actually what's inflamed. A ganglion is like a fluid filled bubble within the muscle. It's kind of weird. And a ganglionectomy would be the removal, surgical removal of a ganglion. Tendinitis and tenosynovitis are both different forms of inflammation of tendons or in this case the tendon and the synovial joint as well. Again, can be from repetitive use. So some surgical procedures uh, that affect the muscular system. You can have a fasciectomy or a fasciotomy in a lot of times in the case of contractures to relieve a contracture. 
a ganglionectomy to remove a ganglion growth, muscle biopsy in the case of if you if they suspect a rhabdomyoma or a rhabdomyosarcoma to biopsy the muscle tissue to see which type of tumor it is. Myorophy and tenorophy, the suffix raphi means to suture, to sew back together. So if you have a torn muscle or a torn tendon, it can be fixed surgically, suturing it back together, a myorophy or a tenorophy. Oops, and then I have some quiz, the usual quiz questions, but I'm not going to go through them in the online video. So that was chapter 9. Your next test will cover chapters 8 and chapter 9. Um, and if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to email me, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. And that's all. Goodbye. Stop recording.